Thank you. Thank you for the invitation to discuss uh, Gary's and Raghu's uh, presentations at this symposium as the only person from with a location in continental Europe who has a speaking function at this symposium. I'm of course wondering whether I'm not just appearing as a yokel from the provinces who will talk about the sites he sees in the big cities. Uh, now, one of the sites I see in the big city is that the big city doesn't very often look at the provinces. And in particular, uh, Gary's talk was very much a talk on the US. And I think there is an issue. So uh, basically, the presentation was about US experience. Much of the discussion that we've had today is about the liquidity of bank liabilities and about fragility from runs. Uh, in part of Ragu's and then uh, in Amit's discussion, we had mis-selling uh, fraud and other things. But a key issue that worries me about this, these presentations is other countries and other periods do not figure very much. I'm not convinced that the underlying theories that are being used to interpret what we see are very robust. And I'm wondering about solvency problems. So uh, Gary's discussion, for example, would not apply to Sweden 92. Now that's in the provinces, except for the Nobel Foundation. <laughs> or about Japan, or about the SNLs. I mean, you were saying no banking crisis from the 1930s to 2007. Well, of course, I appreciate that the Ls are not banks by American terminology. But then American terminology is determined by a particular institutional and regulatory framework, and I'm wondering whether we should base theoretical discussion on the specificities of that particular fragmented system. In German law, a bank is any institution that does any one of the following businesses. Also, the use of deposits for, tra for transactions is different in continental Europe and in the US. With bank transfers, many of the problems associated with checks or traditionally with bank notes don't even arise. Solvency. Raghu mentioned the SNLs, but you talked about the later part of the SNLs uh, without mentioning that in 19. 80, they were both illiquid and insolvent. Illiquid because of Regulation Q and the money market funds, and insolvent because of a bad realization of interest rate risk. The question of what to do about insolvent banks, which again was central in Sweden in 92, is one that we should not forget about. The abolition of Regulation Q eliminated the liquidity problem, and of course we know what was implied by the implications of uh, not dealing with the solvency problem. Ascription of responsibility to deposit insurance, I think, is just too much shaped by this one particular experience. If you look at experiences before the Great Depression, you also have significant moral hazard without any deposit insurance. And for instance, the work of Isabel Schnabel on the German crisis of 1931 shows that very clearly. Now, a remark on equity. One point that I was wondering about in Gary's presentation was that the word equity didn't appear. Now, it seems to me that information insensitivity of bank debt is the greater the more equity the bank is funding with. Because the more equity the bank is funding with, the larger is the horizontal part of that line that he drew. So in that world, property equity funding, in my view, is a must. Now, if I think about the 2007 part of the crisis, which involved the breakdown of ABCP funding of SIVs, 
Well, the SIVs, SIV portfolios were taken over by the sponsoring banks. And the sponsoring banks had an equity problem and not a liquidity problem. So we shouldn't, and of course it was the equity problem that really uh, induced significant reactions then. Going back to, fun, uh, to a more fundamental question, I think our theorizing about anything is in danger of becoming ideological in the sense of Marxist ideology, a doctrine to justify existing relations. What I call the jensen meckling Research Program explain what we see as a set of solutions to incentive and information problems. I think it's a great program. I have myself worked on it. But if we explain what we see as being efficient, that bears a danger of saying, well, let's not, let's not meddle with this. And I've heard some notions of this today as well. I mean, Raghu was using the term cost of equity without distinguishing between whether it was a social cost or a private cost. We should note that second best is not first best, and second best may leave room for statutory intervention. In 98, I had a paper which took Doug's 90, uh, 84 paper and said, Suppose you allow scale to be variable with constant stochastic returns to scale and a fixed cost of inspection per project. So there is a scale, scale economy in funding a few large projects rather than many small projects. In that model, the conclusion was financial intermediation is not viable because diversification will not take place. On one occasion where I talked about this, Doug said, but the depositors will run. So that's not a problem. Which brings me to the discussion this morning about when actually does the information of disciplining depositors matter? Does it matter ex post? when the problems have realized, or does it matter at the time when the moral hazard uh, is implemented? Now, Mathias de Vatripon, on another occasion where I gave the same paper, uh, intervened and said, oh, but that's why we have bank regulation to limit large exposure risk. So Doug, uh, Mathias' comment was actually, we need regulation as a commitment device. We have three theories of short-term funding of debt. The liquidity theory, which has been talked about a lot, the disciplining theory. In the first one, we get frequently get the policy prescription, equity regulation would destroy liquidity benefits. In the second one, we frequently get the prescription, equity regulation would destroy discipline, thus in the Squam Lake report. Now there's a third one which says short-term funding of debt, uh, short-term debt funding of banks may just be a consequence of an inability to commit subsequent funding decisions. In Brunner, Meyer, and Oemke, that leads to a maturity rat race. In Admati et al, the leverage ratchet effect, it leads to a ratcheting up of debt over time. In each case, the argument is that a narrowly defined debt negotiation, funding negotiation with one party, imposes an externality on all, all the incumbent creditors that's not taken into account. In that world, equity regulation would be a commitment device. Now, which explanation are we to believe? That's a question which we ask too rarely when we have competing explanations. So, despite what Doug said this morning, I still believe that the liquidity and discipline explanations rely on mutually contradictory assumptions about information and the behavior of debt holders. 
I also believe that the discipline explanations are not very robust to the introduction of information costs, free rider problems in collecting information, and in particular the ability of debt holders to free ride on information contained in stock prices. Gary was saying equity holders are much more interested in information than debt holders. So as long as Lehman stock is going up, why should I worry as a creditor? But if I see Mr. Einhorn selling the stock short, then I really begin to run. That's a kind of complementarity that one needs to worry about. And I'm not really satisfied by the notion that discipline at least cuts life short at the end if the big waste has occurred before that. So my own view is that the liquidity provision explanation is more valid. But I also believe that there is a, an important sense in which laissez-faire in the liquidity provision world is problematic if the commitment problem is, uh, and the debt overhang problem is uh, neglected. I myself have found that liquidity benefits can actually be destroyed uh, if there is excess uh, short-term leverage in this altogether. To conclude, I would like to add a further point, again, from a contract theoretic perspective. Much of the contract theoretic foundations of what we are doing here presumes basically micro-risks. Non-verifiability or non-observability of contingencies is key. But the risks that we really care about, the risks that are tend to be associated with banking crises, are macro risks. And macro risks should be contractible. One example is interest rate risk. It should be possible to condition on future interest rates. I've actually written a paper on that in the early 90s for interest rate risk, which said full liquidity provision a la diamond dipvic is wonderful, but does not imply that the bank should assume the interest rate risk associated with what it does. Instead, the bank should issue debt of maturities that match maturities on the assets, which means that long-term investors would bear the reinvestment opportunity risks of short-term assets against their initial deposit, and short-term investors should bear the valuation risks of long-term uh, investments associated with their deposits. The simple identification of liquidity transformation and maturity transformation is flawed. We can have liquidity transformation without an assumption of interest rate risk by the intermediary. Why do we not observe this? One answer is again the lack of commitment. The bank does something different. Excessive risk taking. Why does excessive risk-taking focus on macro rather than micro? Now, we do observe it sometimes focusing on micro and a bank going under because it has problems with some particular borrower. But most of the time, it's really in macro. The argument would have to be, and I'll confess that I've not been able to write a really convincing model of this, Macro risk is where the risk premia are. And of course, part of the story of the last 20 years is that through the advent of risk management techniques and regulation, they've continued to take the macro risks, but have hidden them in counterparty credit risks, such as you take a credit default swap from AIG, which is wonderful if AIG has one, just one such swap, but in fact is a macro risk 
when the AIG exposure is at the 500 billion level. The US experience, here again, a problem is why not cover bonds? Why mortgage backed securities? The particular combination of micro and macro risk transfer and securitization is avoided with covered bonds. It seems necessary with the prepayment option, but then the question is, why should we take the prepayment option as being God-given? In Europe, it's not. Prepayment involves penalties related to the shortfall in interest. One should look beyond a particular set of institutional and contractual structures and think more abstractly in terms of the contract theoretical framework that we have. Thank you, Martin. Questions? <laughs> 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 okay. This is mainly for uh, for Gary Gordon. So the question is, <coughs> are banking are banking panics inevitable? Well, according to Henry Simons in 1935 and Milton Friedman in 1960, they were unless you had 100 percent reserve banking or what we call today narrow <coughs> banking. So what, what really matters is the regulatory regime, and I think that the comparison between Canada and the U.S. Uh, is pretty telling. Canada had nationwide branch banking and big charter value, uh, and of course it had the cost of monopoly and had no bank failures ever, no bank panics ever, versus the U.S. It was unit banking, prohibition on, on branching and interstate banking, and it was prone to panics. Um, and the difference was explained by the political economy um, of the U.S. going all the way back to the American Revolution. They didn't want a, a British-style, European-style banking system. And then regulation in Canada was pretty tough uh, versus the U.S. There were these historically conflicts between state and the federal government and later turf wars within the federal government. So, so in a sense, you know, it, the, the bottom line seems to me it's really a political economy story whether you're going to get a regulatory regime that's going to, uh, you know, that's going to deal with that problem. So I, I want to ask that um, the two, what strikes me is the two elephants in the room. Uh, one, we, we just had actually a pretty serious controversy. Uh, is short-term debt information insensitive, like cash, you hold it because uh, you're not paying any attention? Or is short-term debt the disciplining device and everyone who holds it is, is just watching and, and ready to run and discipline the managers? Uh, so let, let's hear the answer to that. And the second elephant in the room, everybody except for one of Martin's slides identified fixed value, floating, uh, fixed value runnable debt as necessary for liquidity. And that was true in 1965, but, but we've invented the index fund and the iPhone. And right now, you could pay for coffee by, by selling shares of an S&P 500 index fund with no price impact, no asymmetric information, clear it in 20 milliseconds, and, and we don't have to have short-term debt for that function anymore. Okay, can I take a first uh, crack at that, uh, which is, look, uh, first, you don't need the short-term debt to be, uh, uh, to be monitoring. Uh, what, uh, for the most part, as Gary says, it can, uh, so long as it knows that broadly things are okay, it will stay quiescent, it will roll over. We have interbank debt markets which are very sensitive to information that percolates in the market. They don't need to invest a lot of money in finding that out. They start getting wind that things are not quite as suggested. That's when they start monitoring, that's when things start, of, uh, start, start uh, essentially uh, freezing up. It's not your average day-to-day -day depositor who's monitoring and trying to find out whether bank am is okay or not. It's your interbank market where they're working every day with each other, they're having dinner with each other, and they find out about each other. That's what freezes up first. And that's something that people have to understand, that it's not uh, your day-to-day -day depositor that we're relying on to provide the discipline. Uh, the second point, I just want to react to something that Martin said, 
which is uh, first, uh, this is all about social costs, not about private costs. Uh, having the wrong structure creates social costs, and, and uh, one can establish that uh, quite easily. You talked about waste, that when there is a, a crisis, there is a waste when bank discipline kicks in, when, when the debt discipline kicks in. That's because there's a ton of equity that you've mandated. That equity gets ridden down. It's when that equity gets down to close to zero that you have the bank discipline kicking in. So in a sense, when you say that there is waste, you're admitting there is a cost of equity. If I ask you to fund some enterprise, all equity finance, don't ask any questions, come back for the dividend 20 years from now, think of you know, whether you provide that finance and at what cost you provide that finance. Robert? So I wanted to... I wanted to react to Raghu's uh, comment about Lehman Brothers in connection to whether there was a monitoring role being played by the uh, equity and uh, bond markets. Uh, I think an obvious way to look at that is in terms of what happened to prices, which I think are an important mechanism for uh, monitoring. Uh, Lehman stock price fell sharply in uh, mid-2007, uh, and it fell again substantially through much of 2008. This is all well before the uh, uh, fall off of the cliff uh, in early September uh, 2008. Uh, the stock price was particularly sensitive in 2008 to bad earnings announcements and to write-downs of real estate-related uh, assets. Um, in contrast, if you look at the high-grade Lehman bonds, they didn't change much in price until close to the end of the uh, crisis, that is in September of 2008. So if I thought of monitoring in terms of stock prices, I would say it performed very well in, uh, in, in the Lehman case in contrast to what I think you said about it. I, th I think there's a difference between monitoring and control. Uh, you're absolutely right. It's the, it's the equity piece. So it's going to vary if the market is trying to embed. But did they do anything about it? Did the board actually act to reduce risk? That's the point we're trying to make. It didn't. And what actually closed Lehman down was the run by the debt holders, who were pretty much whole at the end. So they protected themselves. But of course, that's the debate we're having with Martin which is, is debt governance effective or is equity governance effective? E equity governance can provide, uh, equity can provide information, but doesn't necessarily need to provide governance. Lehman's stock price kept falling. Nothing happened to the board. The board didn't react by mandating better risk management or pulling back from the risk they were taking. That's the point we're making. The debt holders ran and closed Lehman down. That was it. Okay, we have room only for Two questions, Andre and then Lars. Um, I, ju I just wanted to follow up on some of these questions. Um, you know, one of the things I got uh, from, uh, I think, what uh, Raghu said and also Gary is that bank runs happen extremely late. That kind of the last spasm of uh, uh, the financial system that happens after you have a lot of news. Uh, bad news, and in some cases after, uh, as in the U.S., after hundreds of billions of dollars of losses and uh, projected losses. Uh, so this is going back to Helwig's fundamental insolvency point. So from the point of view of regulation, which is the topic of the session, if you're a regulator, if you're a central bank governor, and you're sitting there, and the banking system is uh, losing hundreds of billions of dollars, um, are you supposed to wait for the bank run? Uh, or are you supposed to do something about uh, equity and uh, about capital in response to this observed, predictable, uh, massive losses, and uh, obviously much heightened likelihood uh, of Iran. That seems to be to be the central question that this uh, uh, discussion raises. Let's conclude with Lars and then the presenters will answer in random order. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, Ragu brought up the issue of uh, using monetary policy for financial stability purposes. And one can go on and list possible costs and benefits. 
But I don't think one gets anywhere unless one puts numbers on these uh, costs and benefits and does a proper cost-benefit analysis. And the work I have done indicates that the costs of leaning against the wind are much higher uh, than the benefits. But of course, one should also do a cost-benefit analysis of macroprudential policy. And as an, ex as an example, I can mention a recent speech of Vitor Constancio, vice president of the ECB, who happens to be here in this room. Uh, his speech uh, a few months ago in included a cost-benefit analysis of leaning against the wind for the euro area, where costs <laughs> exceeds the benefits by a substantial margin. It also included a cost-benefit of using macroprudential policy in the euro area. And there, it was the opposite result, benefits exceeding costs. OK, 30 seconds for whoever wants to answer. Uh, I, I, well, I'm happy to take a crack. Uh, so Andre, we, we don't want banks to, uh, to go bust every second, so we put a fair amount of equity. And that equity gets eroded as we go closer to a crisis. That's the fact of, 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 of the case. Are bank regulators, are central bankers happy when that happens? Of course not. And they're trying to use their regulatory powers to tr sort of try and intervene, to try and make sure that banks don't go in directions that take excessive risk. Are they successful? Well, you see the proof of the pudding, not very. But, but, but the point, uh, I think, is you don't leave it just to debt governance. You also uh, sort of, because you think these banks are so important as regulators, you also intervene separately. Okay. Thank you to everybody. <laughs>